that people typically go into saying, you know, in this year, this is where I want to be better. Okay, maybe if you're, you know, already married and you're like, you know, relationally, we got some things in our marriage that I know that we need to work on. And this year, we're going to put some hard work into it and say, you know what, like, it's worth it for me. All right, then we have financially, where, you know, you're like, you know, I want to be a better giver. All right, or, or you say, you know, like, I want to get out of debt. That's one of my goals right now. I have a list. I have a plan. Okay, Dave Ramsey tells me to have a plan. I have a plan, okay, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, all right, by this time, I'm going to have this paid off, then this paid off, you know, and you line it up, and you're saying, I want to be better uh, financially and be able to be debt-free and be able to, to, to do these uh, different, different things with my money that I can't right now because I feel like I'm strapped. All right, physically, maybe, you're, maybe your health is not, you know, what it used to be or, or what you would like it to be, and so you're saying physically, that's where I, I would love for my physical uh, state of mind, my physical, you know, in my body, I would love that to be better. Okay, I just mentioned going to the gym. I want to eat better things, right? And I want to go to the gym and, and do things that's going to be like, like, hey, watch out. You know, he's, he's starting to get a little more than an anthill there, okay? Uh, and so we look at that category. And then we look at the category of spiritually. You know, like I want to be closer to God. Or whenever I read the Bible, I really want his presence to just be around me and, as he guides me in my life and shows me on a daily basis, not just when I come in on Sunday morning or not, not just when I'm, or whenever I'm with a life group or not just whenever I'm hanging out or whenever I'm here on, hanging out on Wednesday nights, but on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, every day of the week. Of those areas, how many of you would be honest enough to say, if not one, several of them, to be better next year? If I, have, if I could stand on no feet, I would, because all four of those areas I'm looking at in my life, and I'm saying that's where I want to be better, okay? And as we conclude this year, how would you finish this statement? Next year, I hope to fill in the blank from there. I hope to have a stronger marriage. I hope to pay off student debt, overcome addiction. Or maybe this year, I hope to be healthier physically, start serving at church, start serving at church. Sorry, I put that one twice. <laughs> Odd. Be stronger spiritually. We, you know, so we look at our, our list and like these are the areas that I want to be, you know, involved in. Or here's another one. I'm, I'm going to put this one on the fly since I decided to do start serving at church twice. Maybe minimize where I'm serving at church and not serve everywhere at church so I'm not burning out. There's another one too. So there. Not typically what you get there, but hey, there it is. But fill in the blank in your mind or like you, you, if you, you want to write it down like this year, I hope to and fill in the blank from there. Most of us if not all of us, I would say, want to be better, okay? Rarely have I, if ever, have I met someone that had the goal or the intention to get worse, okay? Like, this year I hope to gain 40 extra and unnecessary pounds. Uh, I want to raise my blood pressure to dangerous levels, and I want to put myself at risk for a heart attack. I've heard a lot of things in my life. That's not one of them, okay? Uh, or, or this, uh, you know, this year I hope to, uh, to blow my emergency fund and get into an extra twenty or $30,000 worth of debt. I, I just, if you've heard somebody say that, point me to who that person is, because I'd be like, what is wrong with you? We need to pray for you, okay? Because there's something wrong, okay? Uh, and, and I've never heard anybody say, never, no, you know, when, when we're talking about different people, they've never been like, you know what, my marriage was so good this year, like it was the best year we've ever had, next year I hope I just do something so stupid and just completely decimate it. <laughs> cool. That's good, right? Like those are good goals. All right? So, so we look at this, and very rarely do we look at it and say, I want to be worse. We say, I want to be better. I, I hope you do at least, or at least as good as, as, as this year. You know, I don't know about some of you guys, you say, man, 2017 for, for a church as a whole, like it was a tough year. You know, we look away, and, and then there's, just, there's a lot of things going on that it's like, man, like, if this didn't go on, and this didn't go on, this, you know, and you can go through your list, but it's like, you know what? We have to turn the page, and we have to look to 2018 and be like, all right, here we go. All right, ready or not, it's here, okay? You know, you've only got a couple hours left, 2017. I only got a couple of weeks left in my 20s, okay? Not cool. <laughs> I, I had to, listen, listen, a true story. I had somebody... Uh, they, were, they were like, oh, yeah, that guy's the same age as you. Yeah, yeah, he's totally, uh, he's 30 years old. And I was like, whoa, 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 easy there. I'm still in my 20s. He's okay. Uh, <laughs> I got a couple more weeks. <laughs> but, but here is what I want us to realize is that hope in and of itself changes nothing. Hope in and of itself, it changes nothing. Actions do. Hope can be the catalyst for the change, but actions are going to be what gets us there. Okay, I want to say that again, all right? Hope can be the catalyst for change, but action are what gets us there. So this morning, 
we're looking at the title of here is to put hope in action. All right, there are a lot of things that I hope to do. And, and honestly, if I could just do it without having to do the action, that'd be so great, right? One of the, one of the gifts I got this year for Christmas, I, was, I, I sent a picture to Logan, my buddy Logan Tucker, because he like shreds it on those keys. Uh, but I got, a, I got a keyboard, and I was like so excited because I sat down and I'm like learning this song, and I, can't, I, I, I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to sit down and try to learn a song because you, you repeat over and over, and then you're like, I'm doing so good, and then you get up, get a drink of water, and you come back, and you're like, I don't remember where any of my fingers were supposed to be. I literally remember nothing, right? And so you keep on working on it in practice. It's great, right? I hope to be, this is just me sharing with my family, I hope to be a better keyboard player by the end of this year, which it won't be hard. All I got to do is learn two songs instead of one uh, than, than, I, than I was, you know, right now. But just because I hope to do it, it's not going to make me better. It's the action behind the hope that's going to make me better, okay? So the Bible talks about this. It's not a New Year's resolution because if I'm being real honest, New Year's resolutions for me, I was never a huge fan of them because I would set them. I would mess them up, and then I'd get frustrated with myself and like beat myself up and be like, you do this every year. You're the worst. All right? It's, so it's not this New Year's resolution. It's not this motivational speech. The Word of God says to put hope in action. All right? We see this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Here's how it reads. It says this. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children do not, or don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. I started in the middle of the verse, all right, for a reason, okay, because I want to show you this first part, all right? So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control, all right? Prepare your minds for action and then put your hope in salvation, okay? So, so we have this understanding that we, we have to have this action that goes behind it. One version says self-discipline. Putting hope in action will take discipline. Here's what I want to ask. You know, when, when people, Pastor Brian, if you're watching this, you do you. I typically don't like to say, like, let me give you a definition for whatever word. Right now it's discipline, right? But an example of discipline for me in my life is, is just choosing what you want most over what you want now. That's discipline. Choosing what you want most over what you want now. A buddy of mine, he's, uh, he's got four kids. Uh, his wife just, within the last four or five months, gave birth to uh, two twin boys. Uh, I told him if he ever needs any advice on, like, how to be able to, like, take them both down, I have a buddy here at the church who has twin boys, and he'll be more than happy to help him out. Uh, but he's got twin boys, and he used to play in, in several different hockey leagues. He played for, like, five, I think, five different teams at one point, playing, like, five to six days a week. Now he plays for one team, playing, like, once, maybe, maybe every other week. Okay? And so he was telling me, he was like, man, like, he's like, if I could just have one of those days where I could play every single day, that'd be amazing. He's like, but, you know, like, I got my, I got my wife, I got my kids, and it doesn't make sense. What I heard in that was, was, like, what I want most, like, right now, if you look at him, like, what I want most is to play hockey, right? But you understand that if you do that, you're not going to make much of an impact on your family playing every single day, not being part of their lives, not really building on the relationship with your wife. You know, it's probably not a good thing. So what you want most is more important than what you want now. Okay, and so that's discipline. All right, I want to eat out five days a week with everyone from the office now. But what I want even more is to be out of the weight of this debt that keeps me awake every night. I'm choosing what I want most over what I want now. And that's really hard to do. I, I've never been, listen, Pastor Brandon and I, in this next upcoming year, we're really going to challenge each other. Really going to challenge each other. Because I'm one of those people, if I have an idea, I want to do it now. Like, I don't want to plan for it. I just want to do it, and I want it to be done. It's going to be great. And then as soon as we're done with this, let's move on to the next thing. You know, like, that's just where I'm at. Pastor Brian, he likes to think about and, you know, pray about and be financially smart and, and do all those things that you're, you should do. You Because I've gotten myself in trouble several times by just doing what I wanted without really having a plan, right? And I said, I feel like we're going to push each other. I said, because I feel like I'm going to be one of those who's kind of like pushing you to do something and you're going to be kind of like pushing me. And we're going to have to try to find that medium balance where we're not like, oh my gosh, he just wants to do everything right now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he just never wants to. And just that balance where it's like, you, you know, it's going to be fun. All right, and understanding that, that what, what we want most is not always best right now. All right, we have to decide what, what we want most is more important. At our church over the years, you know, since, since I've been, been, been here, we have seen like just 
awesome change within the church, within the people, not just numerically, but I think spiritually, um, different ministries have gone out to where it's like we're not just a church who focuses on inside these four walls. And, and not that that's what it was before. That, that's, you know, whenever I came in, it's, it's just looking out and it's expanding and saying, how much more can we do for the kingdom? And how much more can we do to help? And it's been amazing. The numbers have gone up, but, but also different ministries have started to expand to go outside these four walls so we can be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And it's been incredible. And we've seen hundreds of people who have been changed through the relationship with Christ or who have come to know Christ or, who, you know, who just, it's like, man, like I used to live this way and now I'm living this way. Or I, I used to be, you know, and just you hear those testimonies of the different things that God has done in people's lives. And it's incredible to see that. But it all comes because we put hope in action. You know, we didn't just sit back and say, you know, like one day I hope we have a church that just, you know, we, we expand beyond this. And one day I hope that we can do it's like, okay, cool, but what, what is our next step? What are we going to do next in order to make that, that you know, what, what action step are we going to take to make that hope come true? Okay, and so we got to put it into action. So we're going to be looking at the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, and I want to show you three ways that we can put hope in action in 2018. First thing that we need to do in order to put hope in action is we have to define the problem. We see this in Nehemiah's life, okay? He was this, this Jewish man in the service of the, the Persian king, and, and he was a cupbearer, all right? Uh, so he didn't just serve the king, you know, the wine, but he tasted it and sure it wasn't poison. Awesome job, cool. All right, but we see him define the problem in Nehemiah 1 after 70 years of exile. The Jews were returning to their homeland, and Nehemiah had some friends that just returned from Jerusalem, and he asked them how things were, and here's what it says in Nehemiah 1, verse 3. It says, they said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. All right, it's important to note the significance of a wall around the city in that time, okay? It was the greatest protection that they had. It was security from their enemies. All right, so what we have is, is we have these people living there who are vulnerable. They're at risk, and their enemies could easily easily come in and attack them. See, Nehemiah here, he didn't just hope that things would get better. It's like, oh, man. First he said, okay, like, we have to define the problem. We have to look at what the problem is. All right, for years, I can tell you in my own personal life, for years I dealt with unforgiveness. For years I dealt with bitterness. For years I, I just dealt with addiction. There was, there was different things that I was dealing with, and it's like, man, like, maybe with some time, I just, you know, like, things would get better. And you just kind of have that hope that, that as you go along, but it's like, no, 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 no. First, we have to define what the problem is. I can't fix a problem if I don't know what it is. You might, you know, you, you might be defining a problem that you've had for years, and this was the case for Nehemiah. The walls of Jerusalem had been broken down for 152 years. Somebody needs to end this disgrace. No doubt you've tried to do something for years, and you've not been successful at it. You know, as much as you don't want to admit uh, that, that maybe your marriage is not where it needs to be, or, or perhaps you never thought a substance would have so much control over your life, or for some of you, it's, it's admitting that you need help with depression, or admitting that you need people to be around you. You know, you can't defeat what you don't define. If you're just, like, aimlessly throwing tar, you're like, hey, I just, I'm, I'm hoping to defeat. You know, like, what are you trying to defeat? I don't know, but I'm just hoping whatever I'm doing is going to work. You can't defeat it if you don't define it. You have to define what the problem is. One person so generously put it, they said, tell the truth and shame the devil. All right, you have to define it. This is what it is. Call it out. Make it, make it clear. Here's the problem. Then one day, just like we read here in Nehemiah, you turn the page to read, like, and, and we understand, like, you know, he, where he says, we must rebuild the wall. All right, from this point forward, it's going to be different. We have to do something different. You know, and so you say, like, maybe you turn the page and say, like, I need to go back to the days where I used to pursue my spouse. I used to go on dates with her, and I, or I used to, uh, you know, just, just do little kind gestures. Or, or maybe you're like, well, because I'm, I'm tempted to look at inappropriate images and, and videos, and I haven't been able to stop. I'm going to put filters on every online device that I have. Or maybe it's, I'm going to attend church consistently. M make it a priority. Make it, I'm going to be, like, intentional to say, church is important in my life. I'm committing to read God's word daily. 
You know, so you get to that place where it's like, no, listen, we, we're defining the problem. And we're so, you know, we got, we got to understand what this is. Last year was a different story, but I'm on a new page now. That was the way that it was, but I've turned the page. See, things can be so, so painful, unstable, and rocky for so long that it almost becomes like our, our normal life, and we don't really realize that we're in great trouble. It's, it's all this, like, stuff that's going on, and you just kind of learn to live with it. You're just like, ah, you just deal with it. And, you know, like, uh, nothing I can do to make it better, so just, just deal with it. We don't realize that we're in great trouble in ruins or, or maybe even in disgrace. These walls in our own lives are broken down, and we are vulnerable, and we are at risk, and our spiritual enemy can come in easily and attack. Be encouraged. <laughs> it's in the places of our biggest problems that we can show God's greatest glory. It's in those places where you look at like the biggest problem that you have in your life, and, and as you continue to say, look, here's what the issue is. Here's, here's what's going on. Our biggest problems can show God's greatest glory. So to put hope in action, we need to, number one, we need to define the problem. Number two, we need to diligently seek God. I don't know about you, but there have been several times in my life where either by word or by action, I thought I could do it on my own. I'm good. I have it figured out. I'm fine. You know, and maybe for a while things would like not be great. And then God would come in and like save me and be like, help me and be like, hey, here, here's your lifeline. And then I get it. and I'm like, all right, cool. I got it from here, though. And you have this, this pattern going on where God saves you and then you're like, oh, I got it. Cool. God saves you. Cool, I got it. Like, I'll take it from here. But what if we were to diligently seek God in these areas and say, you know, like this hope that we have, we're going to put action in it, but we're going to diligently seek God. We're not just going to aimlessly do it. I mean, you know, we, of course we want to define it. Like I said, you can't defeat it if you don't define it. But we have to seek God. We have to say, okay, like, God, what, do I, what am I supposed to do here? How am, I, how am I supposed to approach this? What am I supposed to say? In Nehemiah 1, or chapter 1, verse 4, it says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. There is this reality of sadness. He sits down to cry, and he then kneels to pray. The moment he defined the, the problem, understands, hey, Jerusalem is in great trouble. Jerusalem is in disgrace. He diligently took it to the one who could help him. When you have a vision to do something, you are going to need God to help you. Okay, God will give you these visions. And, and here's, here's one of the cool parts about it. Because and you have to be careful when you pray this, because God will give you those opportunities. And if you don't want those opportunities, don't ask God. Um, but, but I'm, you know, there have been times where I'm like, God, I want to do something so great that when people look at it, they're like, there's no way that this could have been done without the help of God. Dare to dream something so big where, you're, where people look, they're like, there's no way. There's no way that could have happened. He's not good enough. He's not smart enough. He's not. And you're like, yeah, you're right. I'm not. I'm not enough. But he is. And his strength in those moments of weakness. So, you, know, you see what I'm saying? All right. So, so we have to understand that, that we're going to need to go to God to help us. There have been times, you know, I've shared some of my testimony here before, but, but there have been times where, I, like, bitterness and unforgiveness and anger we, we just swell up in my life. And I remember trying to, like, you know, once I defined the problem, I remember trying to take, like, to take care of it and be fine with it by myself. I remember being like, that's cool. Like, you know, God didn't really help me whenever I got in those situations, so I'm going to find my way out. You know, and it's just this, this very arrogant way of going through it. And it's like, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine dealing with it by myself. There were years and years of just like these chains, this weight that I was carrying where it's like, you know, whenever I've learned, you know, to forgive, whether it's just like one person who's done a lot of harm or even just in little things that aren't that, you know, it's like, man, I don't got to carry that weight around. That, that, that weight of unforgiveness or that weight of bitterness or, you know, I used to be an incredibly angry person, like where when like people would say something at a short fuse and I would just... I was gone, okay? Now it's like complete opposite where like it takes me a really long time to get there. When I get there, I blow up and then I'm quickly over it. Like that's just, that's just where I'm at. Uh, my brother and I, like my brother likes to, to push the limits, like to see how far. Anybody have siblings that do that? Yeah, they're a blessing, aren't they? Uh, 
But they pushed that limit. And it, it, for me, like, all he had to do was look at me wrong, and I'd be yelling at him. But, but now it's like, it's like, man, you really have to push. You have to find it, all right? Because I, not because of anything that I could do on my own through my own power, but because I diligently sought after God, and I was like, God, I cannot do this by myself. There's a lot of anger that I have in my heart. There's a lot of bitterness that I have in my heart. There's a lot of just ugly stuff that's there on my heart, and I can't do it on my own. I need your help. And I just want to tell you that if you ask God that, he's going to help you. He'll help you through it. Now, it may not look the way you wanted it to look. It may not be the way, you, you know, it's like, well, if I'd have done it, well, you're not. He is, and so just trust him through the process. When you diligently seek God, it will change how you think, and the motives of your heart will lead you to a new action. You may have a similar moment. You know, I've heard several people for years couldn't kick the addiction, uh, different addictions they'd have. You know, I know somebody was, was telling me, was like, you know, like, he's like, man, I smoked for 15, 20 years, and I just, I couldn't cut the addiction. It was just something that just, for the longest time, was, was something that I, would, I was just constantly. You know, and, and, and he's like, but man, I remember the first day that I held my son. And he's like, man, like, that just kind of changed everything, and, and it helped me cut that habit. It helped me to, you know, and so you ha- maybe you have this similar moment where, where some, there's like a different motive that changes in your heart, and something happens where you're like, man, like, it just gives you a, a, a new, like, you have this new action or maybe a new approach. Or perhaps maybe it's when you get a late payment or eviction notice and you realize enough's enough, I, I can't, I can't, I refuse to let this happen. Okay, like you get that notice and you look at it and you're like, something's got to change. Something has to change. You are determining this is the hope you are putting in action and you are seeking God for his power to help you change because you can't do it by yourself. We saw this begin to happen when Nehemiah starts to pray and fast after hearing of the news of the walls of Jerusalem. And and then we, we saw how he spoke to the king to get permission to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall and how God gave him favor to do all of this. You know, it would have been easy for Nehemiah to think, man, that's terrible, or write this detailed Facebook post complaining about the problem and then just go on with his life. I'm not a mason or a builder. You know, he was a professional drinker. That's what he did. I'm not a, I'm not a mason. I'm not, I'm not this builder. He could have had every, uh, every doubt flood into his mind that he was not qualified to do this. What makes you think that you can do this? I don't know, man. Good question. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're able to relate to how that feels. Like, man, like I'm just going to start and fail. Or I don't have what it takes. I'm not qualified to do that. Like I said, we're not. (laughs) But that's exactly why it is so important for you and imperative for you to diligently seek God. My dad had this saying all the time that he would say, uh, I heard it at least, at least once a week, sometimes more. He would say, God doesn't always call the equipped, but he always equips the called. And we only know we are called if we diligently seek him. And if we're called to do something, he will give you what you need, and he will help you with what you need to do what you need to do. Nehemiah diligently sought God and took ownership of the problem so he could also own the solution with God's help. All right, think about your current habits. Just think about, you know, like for me, like well, one thing, you know, that you could, like one thing you could change that you could make today that would put you on the path God intended for you. Imagine what you could do for the kingdom if you were physically healthier. Who could you bless or how could you honor God by returning the tithe if you were financially free? If your relationship with Christ was stronger, how much bolder could you be with your witness? When we realize that God has given us everything, you know, we need to do everything he wants us to do, our lives begin to change. We say, all right, I'm counting on you. I I believe in this what you want me to do. I'm counting on you. Let's do it. So we put hope into action. Number one, define the problem. Number two, diligently seek God. And number three, do the work. You got to do the work. I know it seems like a pretty, pretty obvious statement there. But year after year, January comes and goes, and you find yourself in the same place, being like, this year will be different. It's going to be different. 
Not this New Year's resolution, you know, putting, putting hope in, in, into action that is either empowered or encouraged by the Spirit of God to change your life. From this day forward, because your life is changing, what was is gone, and you're turning the page. After inspecting the damage to the wall personally and acknowledging the extent of the damage, he gathered all the leaders of Jerusalem, the priests, nobles, officials, and he said to them, in Nehemiah chapter 2, he says this, You know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me. They replied at once, Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. The good news is, You are going to do good work. You're going to do work. But the great news is, is that you're not doing it alone. Okay, so when you're looking at it and God's saying, like, this is what I want you to do. That is good news that he's got work out, good work out for you. And there's there's, there's a plan. And he's like, you know, listen, like, I'm calling you to do this. That's great. But it's even better knowing I'm not going to have to go out, go at this thing and do this thing alone. I don't have to do it by myself. God is with you, but there's also others who, who can be and should be. You know, you have to look and say, listen, I I need people around me who are going to hold me accountable. I need people around me. Listen, sometimes whenever I'm I'm out hanging out with my friends, right, I don't have this strategic plan where I'm like, I'm going to talk about this and then this and then this. But but just sometimes through through conversation, it's really cool because this question will spark a lot of, a lot of, typically, in my experience, will will spark a lot of uh, conversation. Like, hey, man, like, so like, what's, what's God been speaking to your heart? Or like, hey, what, is, what has God been telling me to do? And you have people who, like, haven't really spent a whole lot of time with God. So like, yeah, you know, stuff, cool, you know. Or, or they'll maybe they'll just share with some of the things that they would like to do. Or it's like, it's like, yeah, you know what, like, this has been on my heart. This is something that I really care about. This is something, and you start to see, like, this excitement, right? And it's always, I always follow it up with this. When I ask somebody, like, what's God speaking in your heart? And they're telling me, like, what are some of the things that God's wanting you to do? They're telling me. And my next question is, like, all right, cool. So, like, what's that first step you're going to take? What, what, what are you doing? What action are you doing? And there have been times where people have asked me the same question. And I'm like, man, this is what God's put in my heart. And they're like, whoa, so what, what steps are you taking? And I'm like, none. Good point. You know, not, not as a way of, like, to, like, shove it in, anybody, in anybody's face, but more so just, like, you know, just, just gently reminding you, just challenging you. Like, if God's calling you to do something, hey, let's take those action steps. Let's, let's help each other out. That's why I, I genuinely believe, not the only reason, but it's, but it's a huge po- reason for me, why I think the church is so important, why I think it's so important to have people, you, you know, in like faith who understand this relationship that you have with God who can really just kind of push and encourage and, and help get to where you want to be. Or maybe if there's somebody who's already done something that I'm wanting to do, talk with them. What are, what are some of the things, if you could do it over again, what are some of the things that you would do differently? Okay, you can learn a lot from people by what they're doing right, but you can also learn a lot about people by what they're doing wrong. You know, so talk to somebody like, hey, what's, what are some things you think you did right? What are some things you think you did wrong? What are some, you know, and just start the conversation. You don't have to do this alone. You're going to face opposition. If you look through scripture, anytime God, like, had put a call on somebody, anytime God was, was setting somebody up to do some great things, there was always opposition. There's going to be opposition in your life. And, and when you're trying to do the right thing, the enemy does not want you to do the right thing, does not want you to, to achieve those things. And so that's like, you, you know, he's just putting any kind of opposition he can in your way. Someone once actually said, if you're not facing opposition... You should probably ask what you're doing wrong. If you're genuinely sitting there saying, like, I want to do kingdom work, and I'm going to do something, you know, the enemy's going to say, no, you're not. I'm going to do whatever I can to stop you. So if there's no opposition, man, like, maybe, maybe I'm not doing something, something right. But Nehemiah says this. He's facing opposition. In Nehemiah 6 and 3, it says, he says, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. You will hear that voice inside of you. Satan's going to try and tell you what, do you, what do you think you're doing? Do you really feel like you can do this? 
Do you think you can like be clean by going to these meetings? Do you, do you think you, know, you, you, love, you love how that stuff makes you feel? Or, uh, you know, if anything in life, it, it doesn't go the way that you're, you're wanting it to go, you know, you're always going to fly off the handle. You've had this anger problem since you were how, you know, how old, and your dad had this problem, and, and, and just reminding you of all these things, the reasons you can't do what God is calling you to do, or what, what God is wanting you to do. And you're looking at your life saying, this one area, See, I'm not talking about going out and, 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 and doing these, like, these, these huge extravagant things. I'm talking about even within yourself. All right? For, for me, like I, identifying that I had unforgiveness and I had bitterness in my heart, that wasn't going out and changing the world, but I tell you what, it was changing my world. And so I had to do those things. And it's like, I, I know God does not want me to be you know, bitter. I know God does not want me to live this life of unforgiveness. I know that God does not want me. And so saying, what can I do? And as you're trying to fight that, there will be opposition. There will be, you know, it's like, man, you're always going to be this way. It's the way you are. Man, we get away with a lot of stuff saying that, huh? This is just the way that I am. <laughs> Listen, I tell you the way that I was whenever I first encountered a relationship with Jesus Christ and where I'm at now. I'm two different people, okay? So look, I say, well, this is just how I am. Well, God loves you way too much. We'll not let you stay that way. Come on, let's go. We got work to do. You shake it off. That was the old me. This is the new me. I'm on this new page. My God's with me. He's given me everything I need with his help. I'm going to rebuild these walls. I'm going to do a good work. I can't come down. Probably the biggest, the most important reason why you need to be in the scripture and, 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 and reading up on the word of God because the enemy is going to, to tell you, Satan's going to tell you, you know, false information or it's going to, you know, during this opposition, you can come back with, you know, with scripture. Like, man, who do you think you are? You think, it's like, listen, man, I'm more than a conqueror. Let me tell you something. You, you know, and you start to have this, like, conversation with yourself, almost, where it's like, you're in the battle flesh, you know, whatever. That's all going on, and, and, and you kind of maybe might sound like a crazy person, because you're in there, and you're just sitting there, and you're just, you're just it's like, you, you feel like, no, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than victorious. I'm going to, you know, and it's just like, who are you talking to? It's like, man, I got to hype myself up, <laughs> okay? And so you, I got to shake it off. And so you don't just have hope. You have hope in action. It's inspired by God. It's just diligently seeking him and receiving his help, receiving his guidance, receiving his strength. And you just become just determined to do the work. In Nehemiah's case, the results stunned and shocked everyone watching. The wall that had been in ruins for 152 years, the wall that everyone thought could never be, uh, be rebuilt, was built and completed in 52 days. Yeah. You can find the problem. Understand why we're going at this? You seek after God and say, all right, now I've got to do the work. God can do the same for you. And you can find the problem and you seek him and you do the work. It's going to help you turn the page of your life. As we conclude service, a couple more things I want to uh, share with you guys. But we have the worship team come on up and we're, we're going to just um, for anybody who just needs prayer, we want to pray with you guys this morning. And understand these things. It's, it's, it's so, what tangible steps do you need to take? Do you need accountability? Do you need a mentor, a trainer, life group? It takes others in your life to put hope in action long term. Alone, most likely we're going to fall short because we're not created to do or live life alone. We are created for community. We are created for relationships. And we all get, is that phrase here? Better together, right? Like understanding this is a way of life. This is not just a little, cute little hashtag. But it's God serving at the center that connects us. When Nehemiah was building the wall, he wasn't doing it alone. Multiple different groups and different people assisted them. They came together under God's direction to put hope in action and accomplish a great work. To go back to that early thing when I said, this year I want to fill in the blank and know that God and, and we as a church, we are here with you to help you put hope in action. It's not going to be perfect. It's not always going to be, you know. Wish I could always just give the right answer. But understanding, like, man, like, I really care about you, and I, I want to I do this thing together. Growing up.
growing up, I had, uh, some of you guys may know this, but I, I had an uncle who was, um, he was wanted in a couple different states. Police looking for him. Not a great situation. Uh, in fact, his younger brother was actually a policeman. It made it a lot more interesting. Um, but he came one time. He, 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 we were all coming together for Thanksgiving, and it was like the first time in years we had all been together. It's like my mom's two brothers, the baby brother is a cop. We got the son. Everybody's, it's going to be a great Thanksgiving. And somehow, some way, throughout all this, you know, I, my uncle, who was the police officer, he, uh, his supervisor found out, you know, who his brother was and, you know, the connection there and found out that, you know, he was going to be seeing him. He's like, basically told him, like, hey, man, your, your job's on the line. You got to book him. Thanksgiving Day, you got to book him. And I remember my, my uncle came in and, and, you know, he told me ahead of time. He called me and said, listen, uh, you're more than welcome to turn around and go back home if you want. I'm just letting you know, like, if you come here, this is what has to happen because, you know, they're, they're, they're threatening. And, and, and as he's talking through, he's like, you know what? No, I can't. I'm not going. You know, it's just kind of like this. My uncle, uh, my uncle Scott was like, nah, no, 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 no. Like, I'll, I'm going to be there. Go ahead and book me. Do what you got to do. No problem, man. No problem. And we're looking at this situation. And, and I remember, like, just sitting there being like, this is crazy. You know, like, my, my parents made, like, they were like, all right, it's going to happen somewhere up here because we're not, this is not going to happen, you know, at Grandma's house. That's just not going to be, you know. It's not going to be fun. You guys thought your Thanksgivings were interesting. <laughs> but see, the thing is, like, I, I used to pray every single Sunday morning, Wednesday night, when they'd take up prayer requests. I'd always pray that my uncle would come to know Jesus, and it would, it would be to the point where, like, my teacher was almost annoyed with me year in and year out, you know, you know week in, week out for years. I'd come in, and they're like, any prayer requests? And I'd raise my hand, I'm like, okay, yep, your uncle, got it. Like, I wouldn't even get to say it anymore. <laughs> 